Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Episode one of the Mind Games podcast. Not gonna lie, I'm very, very excited to do this. I've been meaning to launch a podcast and wanting to launch a podcast for years. So episode one, history making. Why did I want to start this podcast? Well, from my perspective, I absolutely love listening to people's stories. I love finding people's motivations to do well. I love hearing life-changing stories, how well that they're doing. And the reason that I wanted to bring this to the forefront for you guys is that I think you'll take a lot of value from here, from it as well. So every single episode, I'm going to have a different member on, a different guest that is going to give what I believe some value to you and some level of entertainment as well, that you'll enjoy watching it, but not only enjoy watching it, that you're also going to take something from it to go out and better your life. Hence the name Mind Gains. You're going to gain something from this, whether it's a mental edge, whether it's a physical edge, whatever it is, I want to inspire you at the end of this to go out and make a better life for yourself. So as I've just mentioned, it's going to be a lot of inspirational stories. It's going to be a lot of relatable stories that you are going to find that they resonate with you and then you can go out and do something. So episode one, I thought it was only fitting that I talk huh, about myself, right? I don't mean it in a selfish way. I mean it because I think that my story is very relatable, but I also think it's very inspirational. Without sounding too, without tooting my own horn too much, I do think it's inspirational. If you've come to know me in the last year, two years, you don't really know Jamie Clark, the person. You know Jamie Clark, the coach. There's so many layers to Jamie Clark, the person, that I want to speak to you about. You all know me, the guy who has a successful business, has a lot of clients, works every hour of the day, and seemingly everything is going right in his life. But let me tell you that it hasn't always been this way. In fact, I'd say for 90% of my life, it was the complete opposite of this, which is what I want to get into. I want you to listen to me, to get to know me better, to realize how relatable my story is. And if I can do this well for myself, an average guy, than you can as well. So let me take this all the way back to when I was a kid. That's how deep we're going. I want to go from when I was a kid to the 28-year-old podcaster slash coach you see today. So when I was a kid, I was born. <laughs> uh, a lot of people who were from St. Helens are going to shudder listening to this. I was born in Beth Ave in Sutton, which if you're from St. Helens, you know it's a very rough place. But I was born, I'm not going to lie, for the first four years, my life was brilliant. Typical nuclear family setup. Uh, mum and dad were married. My dad had a good job. My mum stayed at home and looked after me. So for the first four years, my life was actually good um, until my mum and dad uh, got divorced when I was four. And that's when I'd say everything started to go a little bit, not rougher, but uh, it started my journey as a person is what I would say. So obviously we were born, I was born into that estate. I was born into what was quite a nice family. And then it didn't get, I'm not going to say it got ripped apart, but for lack of a better term, it did. Because obviously my mum and dad got divorced, didn't really see my dad anymore. And me and my mum ended up living in a refuge, um, Pennington Lodge, if you know where it is. Um, I'm, but we ended up being there. And what's crazy is it's only times when I sit and talk about these things that I realize the severity. Because when you're a kid, everything feels like an adventure. So at the time, I wasn't really thinking this is bad. I was still with my mum. I love my mum to bits. Um, and I was just living somewhere else. And my dad wasn't there. I didn't really think much of it at the time. But me and my mum lived in a refuge for quite a long time. And she used to walk me to school every day, take me back to the refuge on the night. And we didn't really have anything. Now that I think about it, we didn't really have anything going for us. After that, we lived on my nan's couch, which to be honest, <laughs> at the time, I absolutely loved. Um, because, again, was around my nan, was around my family. But we just didn't really have anything going for us. But to be honest with you, I come from nothing. I really did. And this is why, like, 
I, I try and urge everyone to sit like they don't like you see me doing well now you, you didn't see me when I was a kid um I'm going to try and keep it together as much as possible through this podcast but I might get quite emotional um bringing up like different parts of my past and stuff um so we end up living in um no sorry I'm lying I've jumped the gun here because obviously this is 20 odd years ago we went from the refuge to living into another house um and then my mum um started seeing a new guy um who I won't name um and that's when things I'd say started to get a little bit rougher for me um to cut a long story short I was in um a household that was like rife with domestic violence basically um we still lived in a pretty poor house he didn't work my mum was on benefits and we don't really realize at the time but like it was bad and it's quite sorry if I just feel like if I, if it's like I'm, it's quite difficult to speak about this it is because obviously it's a lot of my past that I don't really speak about and I want to bring it all up for you so you know exactly who I am and what you're dealing with um and it, it you don't really at the time, because you're a kid, you don't really understand what's going on. But it's only, it's only when you, you sit there and think about it that like you realize how bad it was. And one thing that is like etched into my mind, it's burned into my mind. I remember being at my nan's and I had to stay at my nan's for a while. And I remember, I remember being in the car, going somewhere with my auntie and we we just seen my mum and like we got out of the car because my mum was going to my nan's by chance and my mum was like black and blue and my, my auntie got out of the car she was crying she's like this is enough now you can't you can't keep going back to this you need to leave it's not good for Jamie and all this stuff and like it's <laughs> it's upsetting now to talk about it, it is uh, to kind of like bring these things up but this is why I want to talk about it um and luckily I don't really know the statistics of domestic violence but I know that a lot of the time women go back and luckily my mum left luckily she did because it was getting worse and worse and obviously me and my mum were separated for a little bit when I was at my nan's and whatever and then we ended up staying we left the house and we stayed at my nan's for a bit. And then life started to, again, kind of like plateau and go back to normal a little bit. But um, we were by no means on the up. We were by no means well off. We had no money, we was on benefits. And luckily we managed to get another council house, lo and behold, in Beth Abergain. And I, as, as rough as Beth was, which it is, and was, it was probably worse when I was growing up. I, f I loved it because I always say I'm a council state kid and I am. And this is why like, I, I want to tell this story because I've come from that and I'm doing well for myself now. And we ended up living in Paidswood Close, which a lot of people who will watch this um, will remember it because they're a lot. I've still got a lot of people who I grew up with that watch my stuff. And yeah, Paidswood Close, I used to live, uh, number 11. And life started to get a bit better then. Uh, my mum, well, when we moved in, we had, <laughs> when we moved in, it's all funny. We had nothing. Uh, I remember me and mum used to sleep on a mattress downstairs in the living room. And my dad bought me a GameCube. And I'm a big Zelda fan. And I remember, this is a, this is a horrible memory. I remember playing the Wind Waker in like 2003. And I was, we had a mattress, no couches, nothing in the bedrooms. So like we just had the kitchen, the mattress, and we had a TV, luckily. And I remember playing it. And then I remember there was a knock at the door and my mum leapt up because she was asleep and she was screaming like, don't open the door, don't open the door and all this. And I was like, obviously visibly shook up. All right, my mum, although she, I've never spoke to her about this. She probably was having some kind of like PTSD because of everything she went through, the whole domestic violence, things like that. And that affected us for quite a while. Um, and my mum, like I love, 
I love my mum so much. And this is why like, I always give a lot of my success to my mum. We didn't have a lot, but we had, we had everything at the same time. Like we just, she always made sure we got by and she was, I didn't, I wasn't blessed with a lot growing up materialistic in terms of the materialistic, materialistic items, but it, I had an unbelievable mum, best mum in the world in my eyes. Like she was incredible. She did everything for me, made sure we were always okay. Um, so I was really blessed in that way, but she was suffering and dealing with her own like problems in her, in her mind and stuff that had gone on. So things started to kind of like level out then. Um, again, didn't really have an awful lot. So I'm not gonna, this is from like the age of eight upwards and I'm not really gonna bang on too much. Went, went to Sutton High, a lot of you from Sutton still watch my stuff and engage with my stuff. So went to Shirley Primary School, went to Sutton High, loved being at Sutton High to be fair, but I was a very shy kid, very shy, very low on confidence. It's probably surprising to a lot of people that I do stuff like this today because I was a very shy kid, I was. Um, had no self-belief and anything that I was kind of okay at, um, I didn't really have the confidence to really pursue it. So I was like an okay footballer, didn't really try and get any better. It was like okay academically, didn't try and get any better. Uh, dropped out of sixth form, um, all these different things. I just had no self-belief. And I think a lot of it was because of the kind of like household that I came from. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you listen to someone tell your mum she's fuck all, all the time. And it's very toxic, it kind of bleeds into you. So like, it kind of bled into me a little bit. And I used to used to think that, that I wasn't. Um, but long story short, um, she got with someone else who's with him for quite a while. I'm not gonna mention his name. Um, and then I'm going to fast forward to when I was like 19, 20. And we moved from Beth Ave to somewhere else in Sutton. And that's when things started to get really bad for my mum. But this is where I believe my life today started. Like the building of Jamie is the way I look at it. It's like, this is where I started to become me. And... It was 20, moved in the back end of 2014. Uh, 2015, we ended up leaving, but I'm gonna tell you everything in between. So once again, whether it's a cycle or not, my mum was a part of domestic violence again. I did not know. Um, the guy, if you ever do watch this, the guy's a coward. Um, and I'm gonna tell you exactly why. So he was a bully, this guy who my mum was with, but I didn't realize to the severity. He used to kind of give me a bit of shit when I was growing up. But then when I became old enough to kind of like back myself and argue back with him, he stopped arguing with me. So we lived in a three story house at the time. And this is what I mean, things looked like they were going on the up, moved into that better house. My mum had, had a job by then, she was working as a teacher and Seemingly like when I was four years of age, everything got snatched away again. But for like six, seven months, things seemed okay. And I'm a very, very good judge of energy and I'm a very good judge of like situations. And you just feel something's off. I remember coming in one day and it's like, it's like something cloaked me. It's like I got shrouded with this negative energy. And I went to the second floor where the kitchen was, the living room, things like that. And my mum, I was like, what's up? She was like, nothing. I said, I'm not stupid, what's up? And like, she kind of like went like that downstairs and he was downstairs and I just went, all right, no, wor no worries, I'll speak to you about it later. Just completely played off that she hadn't just said what she said. And she come down to my room, she come down to my room later on that day and she was speaking to me and I was like, what is up with you? And she broke down in tears. I was in bed, um, broke down in tears, jumped on the bed, jumped, leapt onto the bed and hugged me and started immediately crying. Like I was, the, the quilt was like soaking with tears and I was like soaking with tears. So she was hugging me. And I remember, fe I remember feeling, I remember hugging it and feeling it. And it's like, if you feel a radiator, do you know you have like the different grooves and the different ridges? 
that's how my mum's back felt. And I was like, what is going on? Like you, I didn't realize you, like, what is going on? Do you know what I mean? Like she was so thin, like so stressed. And she was like, every time you leave the house, he changes. And I was like, what? Cause I was totally oblivious to this. Cause he wasn't physically abusive. He was just emotionally abusive. And we later found out that like him having me at the bottom of the house and them at the top was kind of a way to separate me. And it got put across to me as you'll have your own bottom floor. It's like your own little apartment. Cause I had like my own toilet, kitchen, stuff like that. So like I could say like things seem like they were going good, good at this stage and everything got like dragged away. And she was like, every time you leave and go to work, he starts. I was like, right, cool. She was like, me and your sister, who I won't name, because I don't know whether she wants to be named on this. Um, she's like, me and your sister are going to an all women's refuge tomorrow. And I was like, what? Like, what? Like, an hour ago, I lived the, the perfect, seeming, seemingly perfect life. Family were together in a good house. You two have got jobs. I've got a job. Things seem to be going well. And like that, everything changed. And she was like, we've already secretly packed our stuff. We've already been secretly moving out for the last two weeks. I'm so sorry we, we, we didn't tell you. So I was like, what? Like, where does this leave me? And then she was like, you're just going to have to fend for yourself. And I was like, right. But I didn't mind because I do it over and over and over again. If I knew my mum could get to safety, which I'll get to, I'd do it over again. Like 100%, I'll always put my loved ones like first, do you know what I mean? So when she said that he didn't used to, he didn't used to do it when I was in the house, I, I concocted a plan and was like, I'm going to, I'm going to turn all the lights off downstairs. I'm going to pretend, I'm going to open the front door Bye, close the front door so my mum thinks I've gone. And I'm gonna wait in my room in silence and have the door open a little bit so I can hear, because you can still hear upstairs. It's quite a new house, so the walls are quite thin. So I lay downstairs in silence, cancelled all my clients. I say all, oh, probably had about two at the time. So I was like, <laughs> I was a PT back then, but I didn't really have many clients. And lo and behold, he comes in. First question is Jamie. Mum goes, No, he's gone to work. And immediately he starts barking and shouting and calling my mum names and everything like that. And then as a way of letting them know I was there, I was, I like slammed my bedroom door and then immediately stopped, stopped dead, like immediately stopped. And my mum told me that when that happened, he leaned into her face like this, this close and was like, you fucking told me that Jamie had gone. And she was like, I thought that he had, I thought that he had. So for this day, I'm sat there knowing all this is going on. I can't say anything to him because it's going to ruin my mum's plan. And then I, so I'm just, I'm just in this earth-type chamber of like, I can't do anything. So if I, if, if I, if I say something, if I do something, it's going to ruin my mum's plan. Like she's got to get to safety. So I just locked myself away. And then the plan was I go to work, my mum runs away. This is a real story, this, by the way. Like, it sounds like it's not. So anyway, I go to work. I get some, I get a message. Your mum's left, blah, 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 all this. So I've got to play Daft Bush. Could she have gone? All this. He's like going around looking for her. And I seen a different side to him that day. And it was embarrassing. It's like, like I said, a coward. Like, why would you not do it in front of me? I was still a kid. I was 19, 20. Do you know what I mean? You're still a kid at that age. But that's how much of a coward he was. He wouldn't do anything like that in front of my mum. Long story short, my mum ends up in an all women's refuge, which leaves me homeless. Cause I don't wanna, I can't live there for obvious reasons. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything, but for obvious reasons that I didn't wanna live there. Um, me and my dad weren't talking at the time and I had nowhere to live. So I remember it was May 9th, 2015. And I was seeing a girl in Liverpool at the time I remember getting the train home from hers, being stood at Peasley Cross train station and thinking, I've got nowhere to go. Like I've got nowhere to kind of go. I've got no home to go to, nothing. So I spend like a night or so sleeping in the gym on like the mats and stuff 
in Jimbug, which I don't know if anyone knows that. I wasn't really allowed to, but I had the keys, so I used to do that. And then if I'd used to just go, oh, yeah, I got in early, got in at 6 a.m. when the gym opened. Um, some of my friends let me stay, like, on their couches, in their beds. You know who you are. Thank you very much. Like, you helped me out in, like, such a fucking huge, hugely devastating time in my life. And then luckily, I text my dad, and this time much me and my dad weren't talking, God rest his soul. He was like, why are you homeless? And I was like, explained it, he went, right, Sam, he said, you can stay the weekend. So I stayed that weekend, and when I got there, he was like, you've got to the weekend to find somewhere else, and you go in. My dad, because we just weren't talking. And then anyway, I come in on the Saturday night, and he was like, he'd opened up a little bit because he'd had a drink, and he was like, what's going on? So I told him, and he was like, listen, you can stay here which is amazing. And that's where I live now. I live in that house now. And this is where I'd say I started becoming me as a person. At the time, my mum ended up, she ended up going to court for something against him and won, which is fucking amazing. Uh, she now lives very happily. My sister's in university, very happy. I'm very happy, so it's fucking great right now. But like, at that moment in time, my mum was happy and that's all that mattered after everything that went on. And I lived in my dad's, which is now my house. And this seven, eight year period, this was 2015 going into 2016. This was when I say I'd start to become who you see today. It's been quite a long journey. Started building more confidence, sounds stupid. Like I'd be going out a little bit more, I'd have a little bit of money and I need money. I was earning like 70, 75 quid a week as a PT. I was earning pennies as a PT. I didn't, I was, I'm ta I was talented as a PT. I loved the job, but I loved going out. I loved girls, different things. Young man, right? So anytime I got 20 quid, I'd be straight out going to Wobs, if anyone remembers that place, getting like blitzed off a tenner and that would be it. And that was pretty much my life for a while. Didn't apply myself to being a PT, nothing like that. And I just, I remember like, I remember the exact amount of money. It was £4.62, I counted out. And it was early early 2016 and I wanted to get myself a Chinese I had no money and I had like I couldn't afford to pay my dad rent my dad wanted like 100 quid a month couldn't afford that um so he used to just let me off I remember getting this scrimping this chains together for like salt and pepper chips and it luckily it comes like four pound fifty or something stupid I remember being stood in the Chinese and going I'm not having this anymore and I just thought I just need to do better for myself and I remember thinking, right now I'm smashed, got no money, but one day I won't be. I'm gonna make sure. And that's why I'm like so possessed these days of everything that I do. And I remember I ended up getting a part-time job at Cubby's in 2016. You might all remember when I worked at, well, it was PC World actually, and then I moved into Cubby's. But PC World, I got a part-time job there. Um, took to it really well. As you can tell, I don't shut up very confident with people. I'd got this newfound confidence, started believing in myself, really good at sales, as you can probably imagine. So I worked my way up, went part-time, full-time, ended up becoming a team leader. I worked my way up to like a management position, completely forgot about PT. And even though I, I always felt like I had unfinished business with being a PT, but become a team leader in 2017. But just before that, again, 2016, everything felt like it was going back to normal. Got myself a part-time job, went full-time, was earning about a thousand pound a month after tax, which for me was may as well have been a million pound at the time because I was earning nowhere near that beforehand. So a thousand pound a month, and to me that felt like 10,000 pound a month. It was great. And then everything seemingly went all right. At the time, my dad was okay. I had a nice house to live in. I had a job. And then when we get into early 2017, everything, everything changed everything just went upside down loads of things happened at home which affected my dad my dad ended up losing his way losing his job he always had a problem with alcohol but become like a raging alcoholic and i become a teen and i had to leave home i went back to my mum's i'm not proud of it now that i look back but at the time 
I just needed to get away because it was a very toxic situation. Went back to my mum's, stayed there for a while. And then people were messaging me like, listen, your dad's not good. You need to go home all this. So I went round and at first, he, didn't, he wasn't going to let me in. And then I was like, fucking right, I'll go home then. Do you know what I mean? And he was like, oh, no, 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 come in, come in. Because he was clearly very lonely. And this was in like the, I want to say it was like the March or the April. And I'd just become a team leader in the March of 2017. So I was earning a little bit more money. And he wasn't in a good way. Um, was a really bad alcoholic. Long story short, he had a, he had a drink the night before one of his shifts. Went to work, got randomly breathalyzed, lost his job for being over the limit on his job, which is probably happened to a million people. But he actually didn't go into work drunk, which is what was mad. He had it the night before. I remember it happening because he, he was, I was with him for the morning. Went to work. I come home. He sat on the couch when he was meant to be in work. I was like, "What's going on?" He was like, "I've been sacked." And look, slowly but surely, like he lost his family. His friends didn't really speak to him, lost his job, and he slowly started to box himself in, just stayed in his room, turned to alcohol really badly. And I remember I had to take out a second job delivering food for the Orange Fish, if people remember that place. It was a place on Prescott Road. I used to deliver food there four times a week. So luckily, my manager at Curry's, uh, which I'm still thankful for letting him let me do this, he used to let me finish at a certain time, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, depending on what shift I was working, so that I could go and deliver food for five hours a night for like 50 quid. But that extra like a couple of hundred quid a week made a huge difference. And it helped me like to give my dad money for the mortgage, different things. But I remember going to watch one of my friends at an event in November and I come home and my dad was just like fucked. And I remember... We had to ring to get him to go to the hospital. The hospital assured me that he'd be okay. And then when all that was going on, I was like, okay, cool, no problem. And then he was texting me, still got a text on my phone, never delete him, never delete him. I look back at him from time to time. They're, they're equally devastating and lovely at the same time because it's the last time I spoke to my dad, which, spoiler alert, yeah. Um, obviously, he passed away in the hospital, but he... Uh, when he was in there, they were like, yeah, cool. We'll get him some curve sorted for when he's out, all this type of stuff. So I was like, brilliant. He's going to come out. It's going to be great. He's going to have some curve in place. Everyone's going to look after him. Like, I've not got a worry. Brilliant. And this has been the theme of my life for so long. As soon as it starts getting good, it gets took away. Up until this stage. Um, but I come in, and anyone that works at the NHS or whatever, you'll know as soon as I describe this that you're probably like, yeah, that's what happens. And we're going in with one of my mates. I was like, I just need to go and see my dad. I went in. Um, sorry, I missed out, missed out a big, big part here. Sorry, let, let me get back to this. So I come in the night before or the day before and my dad was looking at me like I was like some alien like this, like watching me around the room. I was trying to speak to him at the time Something had happened where he couldn't talk, like his voice box had gone or something. He couldn't talk. He was really, really not well. And I was like, what's up with you? And he was just like staring at me dead weird. And he, he, but he, he didn't know who I was. And I was like, do you know who I am? And he was like, no. I went, who do you think I am? Bear in mind, I was in a North Face jacket and trackies. And he was like pointing to the floor. And I was like, do you think I work here? And he was like nodding because he couldn't speak. And I laughed and was like, no, I'm, I'm your son. I'm Jamie, I'm your son. And he looked dead puzzled. He giggled, fell asleep. Last time I ever spoke to him. And I later found out he had alcohol induced dementia and he didn't know who I was when he died, which is fucking devastating. But at the time I didn't realize that, I just thought he fell asleep. So I was like, I'll leave him, go to sleep, come back the next day. Let's come back the next day. As I sit down with one of my mates, so if I, if I didn't, if I knew it was this severe, I wouldn't have brought one of my friends. Do you know what I mean? So he comes in, and then all of a sudden, a doctor comes in, like a specialist doctor, two nurses, specialist nurse, like five or six people in the room. They sit me down, close the curtain, shut the door. I'm like, so you see, so what's going on it? And then she's speaking to me about my dad, and then I can't really remember what she says. It just hit me like a hammer blow. 
she was like, we're giving him 24 hours to live. And I was like, what? She was like, giving him 24 hours to live. I was like, we've been sorting out his career and stuff. She's like, yeah, well, something's happened. Something's complicated and blah, blah, blah. It was giving him 24 hours. I was like, okay. And then my mate was like, you all right? And then obviously I was like beside myself. So I ended up staying in the hospital for like the full week. And he just, <laughs> it sounds terrible. He just wasn't passing away. And someone was like, maybe he's waiting for you to go home. Maybe he doesn't want to pass while you're here. The one night I go home, I went home after like eight days. He hung on for ages. He hung on for like a week for, for play to him. Hung on for ages. And obviously he was out of it in a coma. He was just like a corpse at that stage. As horrible as that is to describe, he just was. He was just still and hanging on. And the day I go home, someone was like, you need to go home. You're making yourself ill because I'd stay there, stay there. For like, and if you've ever stayed in a hospital, you do, you, you'll you realize you have like no sleep because people are in every hour to like check the different, I don't know, I don't know anything about the hospitals, but to check like different, different things like machines, the patient, whatever. So I wasn't sleeping. So I went home, went to sleep, woke up the next day, get a phone call. Your dad's passed away. Brilliant. Um, obviously fucking devastated. Went to the hospital, said my goodbyes, grabbed all this stuff and whatever else. And this period of my life was very difficult. I've made a lot of mistakes during like the next six months where I was very horrible to people. And like people still have this perception of me today, which if you do, I couldn't give a fuck to be honest. It's you for being so short-sighted, but people forget my dad died in like November, 2017. And for that six, eight month period after I did a lot of shit I regret, I did a lot of things that were out of character. I upset a lot of people, did a lot of things that if I could take back, I would, but I did them because I was very emotionally, from everything I've just said, you can surely understand. I was very emotionally, um, upset. I didn't know what was going on. I had all, all kinds of shit going through my mind. I wasn't dealing with my emotions well. And um, people who have lost a parent will know you immediately grow up when it happens. And I did. I had to grow up straight away. Um, and then that, that year was very tricky. Um, I kept getting these type of attacks, the kind of like anxiety attacks, um, where like I didn't really know where I was and like, I was so stressed out. Yeah, it wasn't a good time in my life, but that was in like mid 2018. And I got a new job by then. I was working at Sophology. Hated it. Um, some of the geezers I was working for were absolute wallies. I don't, I don't want to speak about, <laughs> I don't want to be too disrespectful. I just hated working for them. And I always felt like I had unfinished business being a PT. I always just felt like I just, never used to go to me. Would you ever go back to being a PT? And I always used to say, no, I, I wouldn't. And I didn't mean it. Like I always thought I'd love to go back. Do you know what I mean? I'd love to go back. I got, I was seriously out of shape, low on confidence, hated my life, hated the way I looked. Like say if my shift was at nine o'clock, I used to wake up at half eight, roll out of bed, not even take a shower, get changed, go to work. I, hate, I hated who I was. And then one day I just was like, fucking enough, I quit, I just left. And in the middle of me leaving, I left with I left with no intention. This was like four years ago. I left with like no intention of going back to be a PT. One of the lads used to work, it was like, huh, wouldn't it be funny if you went to back, back to being a PT now? And I thought, why not? I've got money. I've got money saved up for that can support it for a couple of months. If things go wrong, I'll find another job. So I go back to being a PT. Uh, and there's all kinds of stuff that, that go on. I think I, I think I started back in like 2019. So it's like four years ago. And I couldn't really get it off the floor. And then it was one of those where no matter how much I was trying, I couldn't bring the clients in. And I was always getting like between 10 to 15 clients a week. And at the time that was like 300 to 450 quid a week. And I went back to being a PT, just, I just wanted to pay my bills, that was it. And I worked out, I just wanted to earn around 400 quid a week and that would pay my bills and give me like a little bit of money left over um, at the end of the month. And that's all I wanted to do. And then seemingly couldn't get it off the floor, couldn't pick clients up at all. And then we fell into a lockdown. And through lockdown, I was ready to give it up again. Uh, I was like, maybe it's not working, blah, blah, blah. And some of it just went, fuck that. You've, you fail once, you're not failing again. You're gonna, you're gonna apply yourself. So in the August of 2020, after I'd been back for about a year, I decided I'm gonna get in shape. I'm gonna start writing my content. I'm going to be very active on social media. I'm going to, I'm going to fucking rattle this. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to give it everything I've got. And at least then I go out fighting if I do go out. Lo and behold, 
these next like three years have been magical. This is why I've been, this is why I said, if you only met me the last year, two years, three years, you think my life's been great. It's not, my life's been very difficult. But this next three years, again, I can make it, I can make the long story short. You've all witnessed it. You've seen me on social media. Obviously I went on to be in good shape, did my photo shoot, launched an online coaching business alongside being a PT. I've got shed loads of clients online. I've got an overwhelming amount of clients one-to-one. Can't get any more people in. Like the position I'm in at the moment is absolutely mental. I've competed and won. I've launched this podcast today. Um, I've got I've got hopes of going into like doing like workshops of up and coming PTs to help them out. I've got so many plans, and it all came from me deciding three years ago that I'm that's it. I'm giving it everything I've got. I'm trying to get in shape, blah blah blah, things like that. And things grow. Oh, things don't happen overnight. Like this podcast, I said. I said in 2020 I wanted to start a podcast. I'm here today in 2023 doing it. Things don't just happen overnight. So this is why, why, like I say to people, like no matter what position you're in, no matter how unfair of a shape you've got, you can turn things around for yourself. And I, I'd like to think that I'm like a, a prime example of that. I'm a council estate kid who come from nothing, who come from a household that was rife with domestic abuse. Anything, anything good, anytime anything good in my life was happening, it got took away. For example, um, as soon as I'm born, mum and dad divorce, end up in a refuge. As soon as we get another house, domestic abuse, end up living at my nan's. Get another house, mum, mum ends up going to an all-women's refuge. I end up homeless, end up in another good position. My dad my dad ends up dying. I end up like all over the place mentally. Like I, I've been hit hard a lot and I'm here today. And it's not because I'm, it's not because I'm cut from a certain cloth. It's not because I'm special. I'm not. I'm one of the most untalented, like, ordinary people. I really am. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm saying it in a positive way. I just fucking work hard. And, like, I've decided that I want to do better. And if you were listening to this and you have had a worse life than me, had a fraction of the life I had, whatever, whatever, if you aren't happy in the position that you're in, fucking do something about it. Because... This is what I want from this podcast. I want you to sit here and go, shit, he's been where I've been. Shit, he's had it worse than me and he's done well. That's how he's done it. Like, I want you to sit there and I, I, after this, I want you to have a rocket up your ass and go and do something with your life. Because I've been in the position of woe is me and no one can change it but you. And I know that sounds very aggressive, but it's true. If you are waiting for the right time to do something, you're going to fucking wait forever. Trust me, forever. Motivation comes after an act of success, not before it. So if you're waiting for motivation, you're going to be waiting forever. You need to bite the bullet. You need to drag yourself, get up off your ass and move. Trust me, from a guy who's been financially so poor, from a guy who's been mentally so unhealthy after he lost his dad, after he watched the things happen to his mum, from the guy who's been physically unhealthy, like... You've seen how out of shape I was three years ago. Like I've been to the bottom of pretty much every aspect. And at the moment, I'm winning or winning in all of them. And it's not because I'm special. It's because I've just decided to do better. And I'm hoping that me offering these insights to you shows you who I am as a person. Because it's I don't want people to just look at me and go, oh, well, his life's always been good. Because it hasn't. It really hasn't. Like I'm sat here now, a 28-year-old man. But uh, the previous 25 years before this, we're a fucking roller coaster. And like, it's only been good for like the last three years and that three or four years. So that's why I want you to watch this and go, fuck me. Like that is inspirational. I want you to come, I want to come away from this and do something with my own life. And that is the idea of the Mind Gains podcast. That is why I want to speak from the heart and open up to you. And even though it was very difficult for me to do so, speaking about the domestic abuse, speaking about my dad passing away, I hope you take something from it. I hope my pain teaches you a lesson and you go out and do something. I hope all the guests that sit there, you take something from my clients, local businessmen, inspirational people, the people that have come through turmoil. I hope that you take inspiration from these. So if you were sat there today and you've listened to this, how long have you been going here, Chris? 43? 40 minutes I've been sat here. I said I'd do this in 20 minutes. 40 minutes I've been sat here. 
If you've been sat here for 40 minutes and you've watched this, whether it's one person, two people, whatever, right? This is your message to go out and fucking do something with your life. This is the idea of this podcast. I want you, whether it's one life or a thousand lives, I want to help you change, right? Just because you start at the bottom doesn't mean you've got to stay there. Just because you've been dealt a shit hand doesn't mean you can't play your best hand with it, right? It's all down to you. It all starts and ends with you. Trust me, from someone who's been on both sides of the successful and unsuccessful fence, it starts and ends with you. If you have listened to this full podcast and enjoyed it, please let me know. Pop up to my Instagram DMs, send me an email, whatever it is. Let me know how you found it. Let me know how you're getting on. I want to get invested in your journey. I want to help you as much as I can, whether it's through these podcasts or through these messages. So if you're taking the time to watch this, thank you very much. This is episode one in the books and episode two will be dropping in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this today. And I really hope that you've taken something from it. We'll see you soon.